would uh, like to welcome all of you to this uh, 10th anniversary panel. This is a special panel because we have three real superstars in uh, procurement, supply chain, and really the this fundamental pillar of global health. Now, prior to the global health era, supply chain was not, well, you see I have a bee joining me, I'm outside. Uh, prior to uh, you know the global health era, pharmacists uh, did not play uh, as big of a role because there were very few drugs there are very few supplies. Um, and what, what these three amazing pharmacists uh, have been able to do is really show the need for pharmacists to be really all-rounders. Uh, they often start as dispensing pharmacists, um, counting pills and handing them to patients. And then they move to managing huge warehouses, uh, orders, uh, forecasting supply, and even doing the ongoing monitoring of patient safety. And so there's this critical role that had not been, I think, fully recognized until at least the beginning of the HIV era. But now with vaccines, with clinical trials, with large scale procurement, we see this critical role of, of the pharmacist as really one of the pillars of our global health delivery uh, work around the world. So we're delighted to have three of them who have graduated uh, from our program. We have a fourth uh, in the pipeline uh, who's probably on the line as well. So. Um, so I, I want to just um, you know welcome all of you to this important panel, tell you how committed we are at the Masters in Global Health Delivery to look at all the many people that are needed to bring health equity to the fore. Um, and this is just one example of a multidisciplinary team of doctors, nurses, community health workers, program managers, um, and of course, pharmacists, uh, lab technicians, uh, so many of you who have gone through the program or may be interested in the program. So global health is for everybody. Uh, to really deliver health equity, we need a large, talented, multidisciplinary and creative team. And so we're going to hear from uh, some of them now. And I believe we're starting with uh, Sharif. Is that correct? OK, right. and we're going to start with Sharif Bangura, um, who is a pharmacist, uh, had started uh, work and did his thesis work on looking at malaria commodities and the outcomes of malaria uh, in his home country of Sierra Leone. And he's going to tell us about the international work that he's doing now. Go ahead, Sari. So this is my 10 minutes, right, Joya? Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Thanks to the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, Harvard Medical School for the invitation. So over the past two decades, we've seen global health discussions taking the forefront of public health and international development. Thanks to the call to action in global solidarity around the provision of equitable access to healthcare for people around the world. Equitable access to healthcare forms the bedrock of global health. I often like to use as an example the investments that have been made in three of the world's you know, infectious diseases. I often like to use as an example, um, as an example, the investment that have been made in three of the world's de deadliest infectious diseases, um, HIV AIDS tuberculosis and malaria to highlight the collective gains that can be achieved in global health. These three diseases have had devastating impacts on the lives of people around the world, especially vulnerable populations. For example, AIDS, for example, used to be considered a death sentence for people in low and middle income countries who do not, who do not have access to life-saving and to, to have viral medications at the start of the AIDS epidemic. 
The same was true for malaria and tuberculosis. Currently, patients with AIDS can live longer and the gap in life expectancy between rich and poor countries is getting smaller. TB treatment is now accessible to millions of people. Preventive and treatment tools for malaria are now available to millions around the world. These gains are largely due to a global commitment to reduce unjust suffering and death from these diseases through the creation of multilateral programs like the Global Fund and bilateral programs like the US um, President Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief PEPFAR. So for example, the Global Fund and the PEPFAR programs combined have saved more than 70 million lives over the, over the last 20 years. These remarkable achievements have been made through reliable access to critical health commodities for people around the world. Resilience and robust supply chain systems have been central to these gains. Pharmacists are a critical component of multidisciplinary teams that work to build supply chain systems that deliver health commodities all around the world, from large cities to, to um, hard to reach remote villages. Supply chain management often involves three flows, the flow of products, the flow of information and finance flow. Pharmacists working in global health contributes to each of these flows. So beginning with um, um, products and information flow. So in order to meet um, global health targets, for example, reaching epidemic control for HIV by 2030 requires reliable access to HIV commodities. For this to happen, our demand forecast must be accurate. The needs for all patient groups must be included during planning and budgeting. Pharmacies often work with local ministries of health and with international agencies to ensure that demand and forecasting models take into consideration disease prevalence at local levels and that those models are inclusive of the needs of key population. These actions have enabled programs to procure the right quantity of products to meet the needs of patients. So once products are procured, pharmacists collaborate with other healthcare professionals to document and report adverse events and safety profiles of products. Information generated often guide global and national treatment guidelines, essential medicines list, and adoption of formularies used in global health procurement. Sharif, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you have slides? I just want to make sure. No, I don't have slides. Okay, there. great. I didn't think so. Go. <laughs> yeah. So through this collaboration, pharmacists you know, advocate for the inclusion of safe and effective medicines for global health programs. So as such, we continue to see safe medicines be, being made available to patients. Information management system for health in low and middle income countries continue to be strengthened through investment in global health programs. Stock levels across countries can be tracked and can be tracked and reported. Stock out risk, um, stock out risk can be flagged using current developed systems prompting um, timely mitigation me uh, measures against stockouts. These have contributed to efficiencies seen in stock management. Pharmacists working in global health collaborate in, in the management of these systems. Partnership, partnerships at local and global levels have been vital in establishing strong supply chains for current and future global health needs. So lastly, I will briefly talk about pharmacies' role in financial flow for global health procurement. So healthcare investment is an economic investment. So let us, for, let us for a moment imagine the millions of lives that have been saved through global health programs. These are not just mere numbers. These are parents, children, neighbors, and friends who have been given opportunity to live and thrive through, through our collective goods. Pharmacists, just like other global health professionals, continue to advocate for increase and sustain funding and equitable distribution of an equitable distribution of funds for global health programs so that we could live in a world where the right to health care will be regarded as a right for all. Thank you. Oh, you're thank, muted, Joya. Thank you so much, Sharif. Um, you know, I think you've laid out the framework very well. And especially around the notion of forecasting and planning, uh, that has just been such a central role. And for many of the global health uh, programs around the world, without that forecasting, there would be no program. 
because, you know, if patients arrive to clinics and the clinics are stocked out, they don't come back. So uh, we miss opportunities not only to treat a patient in that moment, but also to provide the ongoing care that people need. Um, and so I think it's just such a critical part and you're right, so many of this, uh, so much of this work is underpinned by the fight against AIDS, TB and malaria. And we've learned so much from that fight now as we go into COVID, as we now deal with yet another Ebola epidemic in East Africa. Um, and so uh, we wanna turn now to Pacifique uh, Nitarangana. Uh, Pacifique is a Rwandan uh, pharmacist, but has worked in Liberia. And I think you'll see us, uh, a theme here with these pharmacists being really moved into international rec uh, recognition. Many of them have worked, or, or all three of these uh, pharmacy leaders have worked in multiple countries, um, bringing their ex expertise not only across Africa, but throughout the world. So Pacifique, let's turn to you. And make sure you're unmuted. You're unmuted. <laughs> Thank you, Joya. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be part of uh, this panel. Uh, we, we talk about the role of pharmacists in global health procurement and supply chain management, uh, focusing on the work we do in Liberia. We are partners in health, um, in an NGO that is working in global health delivery in uh, 11 countries all over the world. Next slide, please. According to the World Health Organization, uh, a well-functioning supply chain system should ensure equitable uh, access to essential health commodities, including medicines, medical supplies, vaccines, and other uh, health technologies that we need. And they should be of uh, good quality and they should be safe and effective for the patients. And in order to achieve that objective, we have to make sure that there are strong uh, systems, regulatory systems, but also manufacturing uh, processes, quantity assessment, uh, capacity, and most importantly, we should have strong procurement and supply chain management to ensure access to those uh, pharmaceuticals for uh, improving health, uh, health outcomes. Uh, I work with an NGO, Partners in Health, which is uh, working uh, with governments uh, in 11 counties uh, across four continents. And our mission is to provide a preferential option for the poor in healthcare. And our approach is focusing on just five areas, uh, staff, staff space systems and social support. And in our presentation, we'll be focusing on the staff where we make sure that the programs we are running, clinical programs we are running together with the Ministry of Health, together with the countries that we support to make sure that we have health commodities that we need. Next, please. And we, we know that the purpose of global health procurement and supply chain management is to first ensure health commodities, but we also want to ensure that they are safe and effective for the patients we are treating. In that regard, we need institutional capacity for procurement and supply chain management and pharmacists play a major role in this process. We need to have uh, strong management systems, but also policies, procedures, regulations should be in place. We comply, but, uh, we comply uh, we in compliance with local regulations, but also international regulations. And of course, we ensure quality control and quality assurance. How do we do it? Pharmacists are involved in all steps of global health procurement and supply chain management, from product selection, when, they work with, when we work with clinicians to decide which medications, which lab reagent, which medical equipment to procure, 
to quantification, forecasting, deciding on which quantities uh, to procure, and then uh, procuring them both from local and international markets and receiving them, managing them, ensuring good storage uh, processes, because if they are not stored well, they will not be effective for our patients. And we distribute them to the facilities that we support. In those areas, up to the final one, we need to ensure effective and safe use for those pharmaceuticals. Pharmacists play a major role. And of course, we work with other members of the clinical team, other partners, but it's a main role that is being played by pharmacists. Next, please. And to be able to achieve our goals, we need support systems, we need funding, we need funding, and we need quality assurance systems to make sure those pharmaceuticals are safe and effective, but we also need data and information systems for data-driven decision-making when we are quantifying for pharmaceuticals. And we work with different stakeholders from the Ministry of Health officials to regulatory bodies and then clinicians because they are treating patients and then we work with them to identify their pharmaceutical needs. And then we work with manufacturers because we procure some of pharmaceuticals from uh, manufacturers and other, others we procure them from vendors. And we work with other development partners, other NGOs. It's a collaboration effort. Next, please. And of course, we face challenges. We face challenges and we briefly talk about the lessons we learned and how do, have we been addressing those issues. Uh, speaking of geographical barriers, most of the areas we serve are hard to reach, very remote areas, underserved communities. This is our role to ensure global health delivery, global health equity, reaching to those communities that are underserved and thinking of how can these people have access to essential health commodities and the systems, building systems, working with uh, our stakeholders and our partners at national level and regional level to ensure strong systems that can uh, ensure access and interrupt the supply chain of those health commodities. And in terms of human resources, we know in global health delivery, we face challenges where uh, staff attrition is one of the challenges, but also lack of skilled PCM uh, staff. And we work with them, accompaniment, mentorship, but also capacity building to ensure that we have qualified staff who can perform uh, pharmaceutical supply chain management uh, tasks. And we need funding. We work closely with the government and other partners to advocate for government, the government to increase expenditures on health services, which will also affect global health uh, procurement and supply chain management. And we advocate for the development of infrastructure. In low-income countries, we have challenges in terms of infrastructure, but we as pharmacists, with our organization, we work closely to ensure that pharmaceuticals are available, but also are kept in very good conditions, abiding by good uh, storage practices. And then we make sure that we have equipment and supplies that we need, but of good quality. We work also with regulatory bodies to strengthen regulatory systems, to make sure that we procure pharmaceuticals from WHO pre-qualified vendors to make sure that we are not using counterfeited or falsified pharmaceuticals. And we are also involved in research. In research, we want to generate data, local data for data-driven decision-making. Decision-making in terms of medicine use practices or procurement and supply chain management. Lastly, we are also involved in clinical services. We work to make sure that 
the, the diagnostic capacity is available in low-income countries, but also we work together to develop guidelines and monitor the use of pharmaceuticals. Next, please. So we, we all understand we will not be able to run global health programs without health commodities. And to have those health commodities, we need to have a strong pharmaceutical supply chain management systems, which involve resources, people, structures, processes, but also their interactions with existing health systems. And the goal is to ensure effective and safe use of pharmaceuticals, which should be available for global health programs that we are providing. It is very important to strengthen global health supply chain management, which are resilient, but also able to respond to challenges of universal health coverage and health emergencies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pacific. I mean, uh, you really, I think, highlighted the role of, of staffing, you know, working with staff as a teacher, teaching people how to do this global forecasting, as well as the ongoing surveillance, um, which Comfort is going to talk about more, the ongoing surveillance of the type and quality of the commodities. Uh, I think these are important roles that you know many people don't see. You all are off in the back end of, of the, the story and, and a very important one at that. So we're gonna go to Comfort Ogar, uh, who will be talking about the role of the pharmacist in, in safety and quality, uh, elaborating a bit more on what Pacific uh, was talking about, Comfort. Thank you, Joya. Thank you. Uh... My colleagues, let me share my slide. Okay. Can you see my slide? I put it on slide yeah. show. Oh, yes, we see we see the oh now we see them. Yep. Is on slideshow now, yeah? Yes. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Joya. Thank you for my colleagues who have spoken before me. So I will be speaking more about uh, procurement in global health, the role of safety surveillance, as Joya has mentioned. And as a lot of my colleagues have said, safety is a critical component when we talk about um, pharmaceutical interventions. And so while we're looking at having access, also ensuring that safety is guaranteed or safety at least someone is keeping an eye on safety is a, a key role that uh, people play including pharmacists and so for my uh, discussions this morning or for my reflections i'll talk about why safety matters why is it important we'll talk about i'll look at safety through the social medicine lens I mean, given what we're celebrating today, this is, or at this period, this is the 10th year anniversary of our department. And it's a very important for us to co contextualize it or put it in, uh, in the context of social medicine and how that plays a role. I'll look at it from the context of high income countries as well as low and middle income countries. And then of course, as we learned during our program, we're always talking about how to decolonize health. And for me, I want to look at how do we decolonize safety surveillance uh, in global health when we're looking at uh, global health as it relates to patients. So why does safety matter? Safety is very important, as I've said, is a critical component of the work that we do. And then when we talk about the Hippocratic Oath, which is first do no harm, this is the injunction every clinician, every healthcare provider has to ensure that whatever interventions we provide for patients do not cause any additional harm than they already suffering. And I think for all intents and purposes, this, needs, this is a tenant that in procurement in global health, we need to keep at the forefront of our thoughts. And then when we look at it from the 
drug development process, we see that safety, which is uh, usually it occurs in all there are here I've shown just this schematic about five key processes in the drug development and safety does feature in all of this, but particularly in the fifth tenant where we monitor the safety of the product throughout its uh, life cycle. And so we know that technological advancements have led to introduction of newer and improved medicines, right? And formulations, pharmaceutical interventions generally. And with that also is the faster introduction of these products into the market uh, due in part to accelerated and improved regulatory pathways. And so because of this, it becomes even more critical as we saw with the COVID-19 vaccines where previously it would take a vaccine 10 to 15 years to get into the market. But with uh, COVID-19 vaccines, we're seeing a shift whereby vaccines are coming into the markets one and a half years, uh, within just one and a half years, this was unheard of uh, in maybe 10 or five years ago, I think it was unheard of until COVID-19 vaccines happened. And so this further underpins the need for safety surveillance. Again, as I said, I'll look at it through the social medicine lens. So looking at the role of pharmaceutical interventions in global health, we know that uh, as a lot of my colleagues who spoke before have mentioned, procurement, especially of pharmaceuticals is a very key component of the work that we're doing in global health, ensuring that the disease programs and more have the pharmaceutical interventions that they need. And so because of how critical or how central pharmaceutical interventions are, it's, uh, I, I would almost say that procurement is, tends to become an economic issue. And because of that, economic issues also then underpin social medicine as we know. And then if we look at how healthcare spending on pharmaceutical interventions go, much of what is spent is from high income countries and much of the data available also points to procurement from high income countries. As we can see also from the, uh, the images on the right of my screen, uh, showing the disparities, the huge disparities in procurement of COVID-19 vaccines, as we are all very familiar uh, with what is happening. So, when we look at looking at it through this uh, social medicine lens, we look at high income country context and we see that because of the advancements uh, that have happened or are happening in high income countries, we do see there is a lot of improvement in the delivery of healthcare. We have individualized medicines, we have the ability to personalize medicines. And with that also uh, definitely comes the ability to better monitor and ensure that there is better safety for each individual patient who is using that product or that product. Coupled with that is the improving computational techniques that are available. There are huge databases uh, in high income countries. And then of course, with that is the fact that there is huge data generation uh, from high income countries. Once again, I would say that I think data has also become another economic or uh, possibly control tool, because you, you could probably say he who has the data uh, is, is, um, has an advantage. So we'll see that because of these advancements, because of the various advancements in healthcare delivery, in acquisition of data, in use of the data, uh, there is better health outcomes in people uh, or with people in high income countries, high income countries compared to low and middle income countries. Of course, this is a, a picture that we're all familiar with and we hear every time. Uh, there is inadequate uh, poor quality healthcare delivery and safety monitoring systems in low and middle income countries. We have limited social protection structures that ensure that patients are often um, kind of shortchanged, uh, if you will, because they do have to pay more. Uh, from their pockets for the little services they get. And of course, we also have limited data generation from these settings. So all of this is pointing to the fact of uh, what I said earlier, all these are economic tools and the economic issues underpin social 
medicine issues. They underpin inequalities in healthcare, they underpin inequalities in health outcomes, and they underpin much of what is happening in lower middle income countries. And so I, I just wanted to reflect a bit on some of the ways uh, thinking about all, all that I've said. How can we then uh, begin to decolonize safety surveillance in global health, given these key issues uh, that I have uh, talked about today? So first and foremost, uh, I think we can almost not argue about the fact that we do need robust systems for healthcare delivery, as well as safety surveillance in low and middle income countries. We also then need to democratize knowledge generation. A lot of the researchers, a lot of the researches that are done in global health, be it for procurement, be it for management of patients, whatever field you, you wanna pick, most of, all of, uh, most of that is done in high income countries with very little done in low and middle income countries. So therefore we do need to uh, focus more efforts in generating building capacity in low and middle income countries. And this capacity could be through uh, academics, could be through professionals, could be through uh, part of the wonderful work that the department is doing in opening up the space of global health and making it inclusive for other professions. Because typically you think, you know, it's only clinicians, but the department is doing a fantastic work of opening it up and democratizing this knowledge generation, collaborating with people in different fields to generate data from low and middle income countries. And then I think there needs to be targeted uh, efforts at procuring, at procurement channeled towards building capacity in low and middle income countries, human capacity, capacity, in infrastructural capacity, capacity in the products themselves. We really do need to uh, have concerted efforts at building these capacities uh, in low and middle income countries as a way of really decolonizing uh, procurement and decolonizing uh, economics of data, economics of healthcare delivery, economics of whatever you just think about it. And so in conclusion, I would like to say uh, from all of that, safety is an essential component of healthcare that we know. The injunction to do no harm is that which every healthcare provider in whatever capacity uh, they are providing the support need to have at the forefront of their mind, including in procurement uh, businesses, in procurement processes. We always need to make sure that procurement is underpinned by the need to do no harm. And then of course we need to close up the gap in health, social, and economic disparities as this reinforce uh, inequalities, as this make continue to uh, make healthcare outcomes worse in low and middle income countries. And then of course, as I said earlier, we need to improve our investments in human capital development. And once again, to say that the department is doing a great job at this and we encourage them national governments, international donors, anybody, all hands on deck to increase the human capital development and infrastructure that is needed to build these robust systems that will ensure good uh, delivery and will ensure safety. And of course, for that, we need greater financial investments. And with this, I think I have come to the end of my slides. Thank you, Joy, and over to you. Thank you so much, Comfort. Um, you know, I think the three of you have really um, shared a lot of important information, and you know, certainly I've learned a lot from each one of you, and and especially Comfort, the the work that you're doing around the world to ensure safety and do the ongoing surveillance that in many uh, parts of the world, as you pointed out, were were non-existent before a decade ago. So important roles, uh, you know, Pacifique has been doing some work on antimicrobial resistance. So there's a lot of ongoing surveillance, safety, quality. Um, and I think often when uh, we have, as Paul would say, the embodied claims of causality, 
when uh, someone won't take a vaccine or won't use a drug, we say, oh, they don't believe in it. But in fact, quality has been a big issue in many places um, in the world. So we've got tons of questions um, in the chat, which is amazing. Um, and I am uh, going to just randomly pick them um, because there are just so many. Um, uh, Nicholas uh, Bleedy says, uh, thanks for the presentation. We as a country are glad to collaborate with PIH um, in Liberia. And um, then he goes on to say that currently the MOH Ministry of Agriculture and National Public Health Institute, CDC Liberia, are working on a national action plan for public health in which supply chain is crucial. How is your institution? I think this is a question for Pacifique, but I think this could be taken by all of you, supporting the ongoing efforts to look at the overall national planning for the next five years. Thank you, thank you Nicholas. That's a good question. Uh, we uh, uh, partners in health as a, a development partner working with the government of Liberia, we'd be uh, uh, happy to collaborate on the, the initiative, working on the, uh, that uh, action plan that you are working on. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good initiative and we can involve our leadership. We can involve our leadership so that uh, uh, the partners in health is formally involved, but uh, we are working also with the uh, Ministry of Health, uh, strengthening supply chain systems, and mostly we have been focusing on essential health commodities, diagnostics, uh, medical supplies, and then program drugs, such as uh, antiretrovirals, anti-TB medications, and malaria drugs, but uh, there's still uh, room uh, for collaboration. So it's a, a decision that can be uh, made by the leadership, PIH leadership, but uh, for me, I really find it interesting. So we can collaborate. We can collaborate to uh, strengthen uh, supply chain management systems in all uh, areas of the health system. Thank you. And I don't know if Comfort or Sharif wants to add any comments to that, really about the role of the pharmacist in national planning, multi-year national planning particularly. I, I, I can come in. Uh, I think, uh, and much of what I will say, I think is based on uh, a lot of what Sharif uh, presented, the fact that we do need to, the, the pharmacist has a lot of roles to play in procurement, quantification and the works, right? And so we do need to ensure that one, we have a, a voice at the table. First, you have to even be there <laughs> at the table, right? So uh, being, uh, showing the value that you bring to the table, showing what the work you do helps uh, in enhancing uh, the healthcare system, in enhancing the outcome actually uh, for the patient. I think uh, when pharmacists continuously demonstrate uh, that through their work and through this awareness creation uh, uh, programs such as we have today, you know, people then begin to understand and appreciate the role and the value that the pharmacist brings uh, to the national planning, uh, be it one year, multi-year, or ho however so long, you know. So I think it's having a voice at the table and but being able to demonstrate that you being, having a seat at the table is adding a lot of value. And I think uh, uh, to uh, changes in the last five, 10 years, as Joya pointed out, we're beginning to see a lot of that involvement, both at local, at uh, national and at international levels. I hope that responded to the question. Oops, Joya, you're muted, sorry. I, I will direct this one first to Sharif, uh, but everybody can answer. This is a kind of joint question from Ibrahim Gassama and Blessings Banda. 
about how do you take this work uh, that you're doing at the national and even international level and make sure that it's implemented at the local level at primary care sites and even to community health workers. So maybe you can talk about that sort of translation of your work from national to local district, uh, primary care and community health level. Yeah, thank you, um, Joy and Gassama. That's a great question. Um, I think um, for from what I like previously mentioned, um, global health work really requires like a lot of collaboration, right? So the point in which um, you introduce um, products into the system, it doesn't it, it doesn't stop there, right? So once products are introduced into, into the system, there are mechanisms in place for you to actually um, follow through that product in the system to make sure it's safe, you know, effective, you know, for patients, right? And so over the past two decades to um, investment in global health, which, you know, we've mentioned about, like we, we begin to see like, you know, systems being built in place to make sure like we document these processes, right? So I know Comfort can talk about, you know, about the work they, you know, um, about the safety work they do. So each and every country do have, um, 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 this framework, and so we uh, uh, there's like a cross country collaboration in terms of you know um, um, documenting and monitoring you know safety when it comes to um, the use of you know of medicines, and so at a you know at a local level, the data that is being generated you know to, to say okay you know um, um, this population group you know um, uses medi this medication and these are like the side you know the safety profiles with it you know it fits into the national level and also you know um, at a country level people like um collate these safety um, um in informations together and so these are like what drives you know um global you know um document like um uh, essential medicines list right so these are medicines you know that are selected for use based on safety and not all only based on cost so um, there's a lot of like, you know, collaboration, you know, um, from a local level right down to an, uh, up to, you know, um, international level. And the same again happens, you know, once, you know, policies are being adopted, you know, being developed, you know, you know at, in, and adopted, you know, at international level, for example, WHO, we see again, um, um, institutions like using the same mechanism in place to make sure that information are passed down to country level and country, do have like the right to adopt those policies and 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 practices, you know, based on local context. And so I could say a lot, you know, um, you know, has been realized within in this space. I'm um, largely due to um, the collab collaboration we see within global health, you know, um, 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 systems. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pass the speaker comfort. You want to take that question of translation from national policy to sort of local level um, and comfort I'm going to specifically ask you to talk about how do you assure that the 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 cadre of workers closer to the ground say community health workers use products safely and then we'll go to Pacific to talk about that translation should I go first did you yes. mean for me to go or Pacific? You you come first. Okay. You go first about sort of quality as you go down the cascade and how do we monitor it even with the most proximate level of, of workers community health. And then I'll ask Pacific also. Okay. Thank thank you, Joya. So for in the safety arena, what we basically do, uh, again, it starts with, uh, based on the WHO guidance, it starts with first having the regulatory framework in place, and then of course, building the systems and the tools. And part of building that system is supporting countries uh, be able to entrench, go down to uh, the facility levels, right? One of the things I always say in pharmacovigilance is the key people who actually do pharmacovigilance, which is drug safety monitoring, uh, we monitor for adverse events, are the patients and the healthcare providers who see them, right? So, of course, one of the key tools that is readily available that we use a lot is training, right? We have to make sure that the people who we expect to be able to detect or report these things understand what it is they're even looking for. How can they find it? And when they find it, how do they communicate it? How do they report it, right? 
So supporting countries to build those systems at the facility levels, at regional levels, at hospital levels, at clinic levels, you know, I, I would just borrow a little from uh, Pacific, Pacific, I apologize in advance if that was part of your response, but I just <laughs> wanted to draw on the staff space, staff system and social support uh, uh, thing. Because mm. if you look at that, that's the core of being able to take the work to the grassroots. And I would, I, I'm not a PIH staff, but I say uh, from all I've seen and the work PIH is doing, I can say that this is a model that really helps to make sure that people at that level, you go to the grassroots level and you build the systems, you capacitate the staff, you give them the tools, you make available the space they need. Because in some places you go, they don't even have the space to sit. They don't even have a chair to sit. So how do you expect them to report? You know, so being able to, to do that. And of course, at this level, some of the things we do then is advocating, knowing how uh, challenged, physically challenged, a lot of countries are, a lot of communities are, a lot of governments at local, national, states, whatever level, knowing how challenged they are with resources. We can, at this level, advocate, you know, uh, be a voice for them to say, we do need, financial support. We can't do anything without financial support, we must admit. You know, so we do need financial support to be able to make sure that these uh, policies and all the things, wonderful things we're talking about here actually cascade to the woman whose child uh, has a medicine and is suffering an adverse event. And for her to be able to tell the doctor, this is what I know, and the doctor to escalate it. And then for the system to be able to aggregate this data, and know for sure that, okay, it is this medicine or it is that vaccine that is causing it, and what actions can we take at a higher level? Thank you, Joya. No one. So much comfort. I think that is a great summary of how we have to all be vigilant and looking and training. You know, I think sometimes there's a sense that community health workers, for example, can't do monitoring or surveillance, but it's really about training and training within the scope of what people do. Uh, Pacific, why don't you take a crack at that question too about sort of how do we get the big supply chain data down into the most proximate area? Yes, th th thank you, Joya. Uh, and, and let's uh, uh, speak about uh, uh, treatment protocols and guidance because they are also uh, part of uh, global health procurement and supply chain. We want to ensure uh, safe and effective use of uh, pharmaceuticals. And usually uh, in low-income countries, uh, you realize like most of countries rely on uh, protocols, uh, WHO protocols, or maybe they are just national guidelines and protocols. But we at the facility level, I would just share uh, one example on how we worked to translate those international guidelines and national guidelines to the local context. Let's uh, talk about uh, antimicrobial stewardship program. You realize at national level, there are standard treatment guidelines, how you treat uh, some bacterial infections, but given that there's limited data on antimicrobial resistance uh, from low income countries, mostly you realize that we are just relying on data published uh, from high income countries. And then for us, we are lucky we have the bacteriology lab, and then we're able to generate uh, data from, from the, the, the site. Then data we generate, I mean, like if you take a sample to the lab and then you know the resistance profile for each of the pathogens, then we're able to develop our local guidelines, which are in line with, uh, with just like uh, the treatment outcomes we want in the rural area, but also the burden of, uh, uh, of infections in that area. So in, I, the pharmacists can play a role because if we generate the data and then we disseminate them, we share with the clinicians, show them this is how resistance patterns are. And now, this is the guidelines. Uh, that, these are the guidelines that we want to implement. And 
Let's monitor the use of these pharmaceuticals. Let's make sure these pharmaceuticals are available just based on local data. Another, uh, another work we do is uh, my colleagues have talked about trainings and mentorship. It's very important, but we also organize community awareness uh, outreach programs. Uh, for instance, in November, we, we have the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. So we go to markets, to schools, to raise awareness so that community members know how to use pharmaceuticals uh, so that they can just uh, ensure safe and effective use of pharmaceuticals. That's what I can share. Thank you. So Pacific, um, maybe you can follow up by just saying what kind of indicators um, would you use? Sort of how do you make sure a supply chain is intact? Um, you know, that's a question from Ajit and Rwanda. Uh, you know, are there tracers? Are there how do you how do you make sure that you're fulfilling universal health coverage? Because you can't look at everything all at once, or maybe you yes. can. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, Thank you, thank you, Ajit. That's a good question. So, to ensure uh, you have a strong uh, supply chain systems, uh, um, not only speaking of support systems. Of course, you need support systems. You need funding. You need data management system. And uh, I talked about it. You need those like the management system. You have uh, uh, the quality management system. But mainly, we have some specific indicators that we monitor. Uh, First of all, like we monitor uh, the availability of pharmaceuticals. We have indicators, like we need to know our order fill rate, how, how are we able to satisfy um, our, the, the needs of our, our clients to ensure that pharmaceuticals are always available. But we also have uh, other indicators related to uh, the, the performance, such as we know like what is the stockout rate for these particular pharmaceuticals, and then what uh, how can we minimize or even prevent uh, the roast of uh, the, ro the roast that may be due to pharmaceuticals expiring because they are not used? So it's balancing. We are not over uh, overestimating, but we are not also underestimating. We want to ensure they are always available. How how about the data quality? Uh, because if you don't have good data quality inventory. Uh, data accuracy. If it's not good, you will not be able to anticipate and uh, do forecasting to know uh, the quantities you need. So basically, uh, I would just say we need, uh, first of all, we need funding, we need uh, the data management system so that we are able to, uh, to have real data uh, in, in real time. And then we use electronic inventory management system so that we can easily uh, track the use of pharmaceuticals. And then we follow up on to make sure that our key performance indicators are monitored on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Pacific. Uh, I'm gonna go to um, Sharif. Uh, for this, but it, again, it could be any of you. Um, it's a combined question from Dr. Rob Riviello and Dr. Lena Doman. What do we do about, we've talked a lot about HIV, TB, malaria, which I know is what you're working on uh, right now, Sharif, but what about the non-pharmaceutical commodities, the oxygen, IV fluids, some of the surgical materials? How do we uh, how do we make sure that those are stocked? How do we do forecasting on that? And also quality. There's uh, a question about particularly anesthesia drugs that aren't effective. So I'm gonna let uh, three of you answer that first and then we'll go to others. Yeah, um, thank you, Joya, for that one. Um, so as we, all aware that you know mostly um, global health discussions, you know, you know, are mostly centered around you know you know equity. You know, I'm, I'm mostly centered around how do you reach more people. I'm mostly centered around like um, you know bringing people that are not normally you know um, in normal health discussions. And so, 
yeah, the, the reason why like HIV, you know, tends to be like one good example because it tends, you know, it's, it, it has been like one disease condition that sort of like, you know, um, lay the framework for, um, for global health discussions. And uh, we saw that like more funding for global health program, you know, happen, you know, through this um, focus that was given to, to HIV. And so as the world feels now that, you know, a disease, you know, um, for example, like HIV that 20 years ago, that most people think, you know, was unbeautable, that we cannot do anything about it, but we see that with global, you know, um, 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 solidarity and collaboration, look at the, the amazing genes we are able to get, you know, um, the previous goal for it, you know, we used to talk about like the 95, 1990, you know, um, target. Now, because, you know, we do so much well in this um, area, people, you know, now the current, you know, goal is, you know, it's around like 95%. How do you bring 95%, you know, of patient, HIV patients for them to know their status, you know, for them to be on, on treatment or viral suppression. And now we're going further by saying, okay, we can do epidemic, con you know, uh, uh, disease control. And so, a lot, you know, has been learned, you know, around this global col um, collaboration, and we see that being tapped into, um, for example, like COVID, like you know, with the the creation, of, you know, of Covax, you know, which is like a centralized, you know, um, um, um pooled um, um, mechanism for low and income, low and middle income countries for them to have access, you know, to um, critical, you know, um, for them to have access to COVID vaccines, and so um, as you know, based on these lessons, you know, um, there has been like so much discussions now, you know, around universal health coverage, right? So how do you provide, you know, healthcare that cuts across for everyone? And so once, you know, we continue to pay more attention into that discussion, then people will begin to think about how do we create, you know, a sustained funding mechanism, you know, um, um, for us to meet um, um, the needs of everyone. And so there are like a lot of things, you know, um, that could help us, you know, um, um, you know, I'm leveraging on the examples of, you know, HIV and what we are doing now with COVID, but a lot of like research you know, has been done in the area of like disease burden. So we know now, you know, what are those disease burden? And so, um, trans, you know, um, using those like, you know, epidemi epidemi epidemiologic data to aid our quantification process will help us make sure that you know we have you know safe and effective med you know, uh, medications for you know um, for women you know um that, that you know um that may require you know um um um, um, um and c sections right you know it's may ensure you know it, it could ensure us you know um to make sure that we have you know um rights planning in place for um for people that are actually like going through surgical procedure that may require like you know anesthetic medication and so like the more we continue to push you know, you know, um, the boundary and to bring in like more um, 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 people, in, you know, um, into the safety nets and which I think the idea, you know, you know around um, um, this universal health co coverage could be like, a, you know, um, uh, the key for us to unlock some of these challenges because if we don't think about it, if we don't consider it, you know, as a problem, you know, of reaching out like, you know, some of these groups like, Few people think about like, you know, if you're going for surgical procedure, they think you can afford it. So no one cares, you know, you know, you know about like the medication that, that you may need for that, you know, uh, for that process. And that assumption most times is not correct because we see like so many people actually, you know, so many deaths, you know, happens, you know, in those procedures um, due to like substandard or substandard medication, or it could be due to like people not, you know, not even like you know, having the means to afford, you know, medications for those procedures. So again, to wrap it up, like the more we continue to think as a global health community of bringing more, you know, um, 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 people on board, for example, through um, our discussion, you know, around you know, universal health coverage, that could, you know, unlock funding mechanism and that could unlock, you know, um, um, systems and barriers that we think are not normally, you know, um, you know um, 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 solvable. Yeah, Jaya. Okay, I'm wondering, Pacific, I know you've done a lot of work on surgery and surgical um, uh, procurement and supply chain. Maybe you can mention some of that work as it relates to Dr. Raviello's question. How do you think about that? Thank, thank you, Joya. And, and I want just to uh, comment on this. Uh, and we have been working very closely with clinicians. Uh, you work with 
uh, surgeons, you work with uh, nurses and midwives to understand their needs. So that's very important in terms of like a product selection, which, which medications that they are using, but also which medical supplies they are using, especially like with sutures, uh, they have different specifications. So working with them to make sure that we, we know what they need, and then we finalize specifications. And then we, we have been working with them for inventory tracking systems so that we know like how they are using them. And then we, are, we use data for forecasting and quantification. And it's very important because in the past, you would realize that uh, it wasn't mainly the role of pharmacists, where the pharmacists would be focusing on medications. And then you realize that uh, surgeons, they need uh, different types of surgical materials and supplies. So working closely with them, understand their needs, and then making sure you have full specifications, and then setting systems for tracking systems. And especially that we use electronic inventory management system, we can easily uh, track the records and then we know what they have been using and then we anticipate uh, we, uh, we, when we are pressing orders, we can order enough quantities that they need. So there is a need for pharmacists to be involved in all of those uh, uh, activities, not only focusing on medications, but also medical supplies, oxygen, Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and I think um, as Pacifique is pointing out to working with as part of an interdisciplinary team, I, I, what I've seen with our amazing pharmacy colleagues is getting that real time feedback from clinicians about what's working, what's not, what their needs are, but also the need for systems. And so I'm going to give this one to you, Comfort, and then we'll probably wrap up, which is, you know, how do you see the, the need for electronic systems in your work currently what you're doing, which is huge data around the world, but also on the local level. And, and what do we do about places that don't have such systems? And there are several people who ask similar questions. Yeah, thank you, Joya. That's a very key question because part of that work that I'm doing now is around you know those databases. How do you turn data into evidence for decision-making? And needless to say, in LMIs is many countries, especially in Africa, we are hugely, hugely challenged by uh, data availability, data completeness, uh, uh, and all of that. So I think electronic, having electronic data management systems is, is critical. We cannot run away from it for too long. We can manage without it, but we cannot run away for, from it for too long, especially if we want to be part of the global conversations. Uh, and as I said in my talk, if we want to also ensure that data from Africa or from low and middle income countries is informing decisions that affect the people, right? So we have to work towards it. But having said that, we do recognize recognize that countries are also challenged uh, with resources and it does require uh, huge financial resources. What I, I would like to say is that I think we do need to move away from paper data collection, but before then we can continue to collect our data on paper because we do need data any in whatever form it comes, right? We need that data to be able to inform our decisions. So while we're working our way to getting the big data, we can continue to use the paper-based uh, systems that we have. But then I, 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 there is definitely a silver lining because a lot of there are a lot of applications these days that support data collection. You know, so we have innumerable applications that collect data. I think governments and uh, communities communities need to be more aware of the data that is being generated and where that data is going, and then being able to link up those data, right? One of the key ways we can try to manage the data we have is data linkages. We see pockets of electronic data in different places. In many countries, we're setting up 
uh, universal health coverage. We're setting up insurance systems. Of course, those systems run with data. So we just need to be able to creatively harness all of the data in these different points. We have a lot of public and private facilities. And also with thanks to funding from many donors, funding from Global Fund, funding from USAID and so many donors, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We see particularly also in the arena of the public health programs, we see a lot of insistence in moving data, in ensuring that electronic systems are set up in those facilities. And so we need a little, we need to be a little more uh, intentional about it. Once those systems are set up for HIV, we can then manage them, broaden the use of that system, right? To other healthcare delivery systems. It's not going to happen overnight for sure, but the infrastructure is already being laid. The foundation has been laid. So we just need to continue building on the uh, foundation that already exists. And then uh, definitely uh, in many of the countries I work with, when you talk about going all electronic in data collection, they would, you, the first thing you hear is it's not going to work. You cannot dispense with the, the paper data collection. You know, so while we're working our way to ensuring that all the electronic systems are working and connected, we still have to make sure that we're collecting very good on quality data uh, the way we're traditionally collecting it. Thank you so much, Comfort. And I want to thank all of our amazing uh, speakers and pharmacists. I think uh, we've we've hit with many of the uh, the questions here, really about systems. Uh, I guess I'll have one. There's one last question I'd like all of you to take um, take a shot at briefly, and then we'll close. And that is, what do we do about new drugs? You know, new vaccines. Uh, how do we bring them online? How do we try to forecast something that's new. You can think of the COVID-19 vaccine or therapeutics. You can think of the, some of the drugs we're using for cancer care, uh, new surgical techniques. So I'll start with Sharif uh, and uh, why don't you go first and how do you, how do you address a new drug or a new commodity? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Joya. Um, that's a very in interesting question. Um, Normally, I think the need for those like for new products are uh, basically will be guided by, you know, by the, the disease burden, you know, again, you know, at a local level. So once, you know, um, there is a need for it and uh, based on that disease burden and the country feels that they need that product. So I think the forecasting, you know, model is actually like built around around it. So for example, if you look at COVID now, even though like the vaccines are new, so if you're planning for COVID, you just have to look at, you know, um, your population, right? And so that could be like the denominator for your need, you know, for that new product. And um, yeah, even though products may be, may be new, but they have to go through, you know, regulated, you know, regulatory systems and also go through like country, you know, um, I mean, essential medicines, you know, um, framework. So once they pass that, then I think the need, you know, at a country level is mostly being determined by um, um, disease prevalence, you know, pattern. Thank you, yeah. Comfort, I'd love to hear your uh, take as you're working on uh, a lot of new uh, new products and, and how a pharmacist, what's the role of the pharmacist bringing those online? Thanks, Zeta. I, I, I think I would echo what Sharif said. And it's all about data. Everything's about data, right? So you need to know what is the burden of the disease, right? Before you can bring it in. You need to know who needs it, when they need it, how much of it they need, you know? So until you have data, it's, it's difficult. And as we often see, much of our forecasting or much of the work we do around that is often limited or guided by data from other countries, right? So we cannot overemphasize the need for data, collecting locally relevant data that will guide your decision-making. So I, I do encourage that, you know, we keep moving forward with those systems that collect data that help us then to make uh, the necessary decisions 
for new medicines, old medicines, vaccines, whatever it is. Over. And Pacific, last word, new drugs. What do you see in the future? <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, Joya. Um, I, I'm just, uh, uh, I equal what my colleagues uh, uh, said. It's uh, just, uh, we focus on mobility data and then in the long run, we, we monitor uh, consumption data so that once we have enough data, then we can translate to consumption data for forecasting and quantification. Uh, but mainly at the beginning, it's just uh, basing on data on disease burden and then uh, setting systems on how to track uh, consumption data. That's what we usually do. And uh, we, uh, we, we have just collaborated with uh, clinicians like at the beginning, like I mean prescribers uh, to make sure there are clear guidelines but also uh, tracking systems. And in that case, uh, it becomes easier in future when we need to uh, uh, procure the same medications uh, because we have enough data. Thank you. Great. Mm. Thank, thank you all so much. What a great, great panel. Uh, I think you guys are superstars and we're just so proud to have all of you as our alumni. Uh, in this important cadre in global health. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Our next uh, panel will be November 18th. Um, and uh, we're very excited to continue with this 10th anniversary series. And I wanna thank Christina for all of her work in coordinating and Bailey as always for uh, all the, the support of the, the, this, uh, this webinar and also the program. So thank you very much.